The last couple of classes have been anything but uh, uh, happy, if you're a fan of the Allies. Uh, the last two have been known as Darkest Days 1 and 2. Well, today, as a tribute to Star Wars, I'm going to refer to this class as the Allies Strike Back. So, we're going to talk about early U.S. carrier raids, Coral Sea, and Midway. Well, as we've seen so far, the Japanese have been running wild in the Pacific. Uh, for example, the Battle of the Java Sea, their uh, torpedoes sink the uh, Abda cruisers. We've seen land-based Japanese air power destroy two capital ships, the Prince of Wales and the Repulse. We've seen their key carrier force, Kido Butai, destroy Pearl Harbor then attack Darwin. And the thing I didn't talk about is they make a raid into the Indian Ocean. They sink two British cruisers and a British aircraft carrier and basically chase the British fleet completely out of the Indian Ocean. So they have got a tremendous amount of carrier power. And as we've seen, the Prince of Wales and the Repulse, the battleship is no longer the key arbiter of naval power. That has shifted to aircraft, and particularly in naval terms, the aircraft carrier. So with that said, let us take a little look about the two different fleets' main carrier strength. So we'll look at the U.S. and Japan, their carriers. Well, these two carriers, the Lexington and the Saratoga, were originally designed to be battle cruisers. In other words, lightly defended fast battleships. Because of the 1921 Washington Naval Agreement, we have too much tonnage of battleships and these ships would have to be destroyed. They're under construction. And we have tonnage available though to build aircraft carriers. And indeed, these two ships are converted to aircraft carriers. And the Japanese do something similar as well. The Kaga is meant to be a battleship. It is converted to an aircraft carrier. And the Akagi is meant to be a battle cruiser. It is converted to an aircraft carrier. So, yes. How many modifications had to be made for the basic hull? Not a lot to the hull, but because the, the hull was virtually completed. Okay. But uh, the, the, the whole structure, the whole superstructure had, of course, to be changed. Uh, the barbettes were beginning to be installed on the Saratoga. If you understand what a barbette is, that's what the armored thing that holds the turret. Those were removed because that structure some of it had been. But basically, they were not that difficult to convert. So anyway, these things, when they were built, are 37,000 tons. They are the largest aircraft carriers in the world at the time of their completion. So they are... Pretty fast, uh, 33 knots. They carry 78 aircraft, which for that time was a lot of aircraft. And they have a couple of other things because they really don't understand carriers at this time. These remember, carriers are new. They weren't developed until mid World War One and very primitive at that point. So they have only two elevators. So that makes it difficult for them to bring their aircraft up quickly. You'll see that future carriers will all have three elevators. Another problem with these ships, and Japanese included, is they have an enclosed hangar deck. Let's just look at that briefly. We have a flight deck. That's where the planes land and take off. Then underneath that, you have a hangar deck where the planes are maintained, armed, and fueled, etc. The Japanese actually use multiple hangar decks, one under the other. So that's part of the an issue with these aircraft carriers because they have an enclosed hangar deck. So why is that a problem is you can't fire up those aircraft while they're on the hangar deck. So you have to get those engines heated up on top. So again, with only two elevators, that makes these relatively slow. Another thing that goes on at this time with these aircraft carriers is people don't really know much about aircraft carriers and planes, when these are built, haven't achieve the capabilities they will get by the time 15 years later goes by. So these aircraft are pretty primitive. So the thought is, is they are not capable of defending the, these ships. So they actually put 
eight-inch gun turrets on these like they were a heavy cruiser. Of course, as World War II goes along, that certainly would be redundant, and those are the survivors are all removed. But if you look at this picture, you'll see the two big carriers at the top. And if you look at the middle of the picture, there's a little bitty carrier in there. And that's our first carrier, the Langley. So you get an idea of the scale of these things. <laughs> Another piece, real quickly, is how would you tell these two ships apart if you're in the air? They look exactly alike. What they did was they put a vertical stripe on the Saratoga and a horizontal ring around the Lexington. So if you're a pilot, that's how you would identify which ship was which. <clears throat> well, an improvement on our aircraft carriers comes in the 1930s where we built the Yorktown class. The Yorktown class is a 20,000 ton carrier. It has three elevators. Uh, it's a little bit slower, 32 knots, but it does carry 80 aircraft. And one thing I need to notice on this picture, if you look carefully, is you can see through between the flight deck and the hangar deck. And the reason is, is they made that like garage doors. So like rolling shutters would come down. So that hangar deck is open. That's got some big advantages. First of all, you can warm up your planes on the hangar deck. Second of all, if you receive damage, then you could say there's ordnance laying around. You can basically just take that ordnance and just shove it off the side of the ship. So that stuff is less likely to explode. And again, they would be able to spot those planes on the deck. Certainly a lot of advantages. The other key advantage is this, this ship is extremely survivable, not only because of the rolling shutters, but the fact is it has redundant fire extinguishing capability. And something no other carrier in the world has at this time is they can drain the fuel system. Remember, high octane gasoline is mighty explosive and catches fire really easy. So what they could do is they could drain their fuel lines and then fill them with an inert gas. So that makes these ships extremely, extremely survivable. What was the octane of that by aviation fuel? What year is it? 43. <laughs> 43. In Europe, the octane of fuel in 43 was probably running around 130 octane. Earlier in the war, it was not. By the end of World War II, just as an aside, the octane of uh, aviation gas had gotten up to as high as 150 octane. So, but anyway, we digress. Let's talk about the Japanese carriers. Japanese carriers, and I'll talk about the Hiryu here and the Soryu is its kind of half-sister. They're about 19,000 tons. They're extremely fast at 34 knots and they carry 64 aircraft and nine spares. The way they did the spares is they would be hung up in the hangar deck and basically disassemble. They would bring them down and assemble them and then use them. Still, still a large usable amount of aircraft. <clears throat> they have three elevators, but they have an enclosed hangar decks, not like our, our aircraft carriers. That can be a problem, as we'll see in this battle. Well, they have almost no armor either. They needed to keep the weight down. Well, big problem with Japanese carriers is they incorporate their fuel tanks into the hull. So if the hull sustains damage or is, you know, there's a, even a near miss can start to rupture a hull, that fuel will begin to leak. They have enclosed hangar decks, and indeed that would fill with fumes and a spark will blow these up. So it's a big problem, but they never ever really use their carriers to on the flight deck. So basically when I bring a plane up, it's not the motor's not running, but it's fully armed and fully fueled. They don't fuel and arm aircraft on the flight deck. We do. So it, it's a big difference as how they would maintain these aircraft. Well, I'd like to talk about these two carriers, which is the Shokaku and the Zuikaku. They are perhaps, in my opinion, these are the world's best aircraft carriers at the time. Uh, they're very fast, they're large, and we don't have anything comparable until 1943 when we launched the Essex class. So a little look at these. They carry 72 aircraft and 12 spares, but most importantly, they have an armored deck. Now, the flight deck is not armored, 
But the hangar deck right below that has five and a half to six inches of armor. So if a bomb penetrates the flight deck and explodes in the hangar deck, it will not go further down into the ship and damage its engines and, and the other hangar decks. So that makes these a lot more survivable than other Japanese carriers. They also have redundant fire extinguishing systems. Uh, and they, of course, they have three hangars, same issues. They cannot use their decks. Uh, they do not use their decks for uh, arming and fueling aircraft. But a great, great carriers, really. Uh, definitely, I think, the world's best at this time. Well, <laughs> the carrier doctrine for each Navy is extremely different. The Japanese have come up with something uh, that no other Navy in the world has done. I talked a bit about this at Pearl Harbor, and that is they've created Kido Butai Mobile Force or Strike Force. And they have the capability to launch, as we saw at Pearl Harbor, 300 plus aircraft in one mass formation. So that is a huge advantage. No, Again, nobody else has this capability. So when they launch aircraft, it's it's got some really got some striking power. And again, it's it's well controlled, it's well organized, and it's much, much more potent than any other Navy's capability with aircraft carriers at this time. Well, the thing about Japanese carriers is they have some severe limitations, though. For example, they have to operate in visual range of each other. The reason being is they don't want to use their radios to give away their position by radio direction finding. So they operate in a tight group. So they all can signal each other, literally in visual range. Uh, and because of this, another factor is they don't have radar. Japanese radar at this time is not deployed on carriers. And because they don't have radar, that limits their ability to see where incoming aircraft are that would be attacking them. So what they do is they take their escorts and spread them out. So their escorts are spread out a great distance away from their primary carriers. And then they don't really have radio control of their combat air patrol, their fighters that are up in there to defend the carriers. So what they do, again, is they have these ships that are out in the perimeter. And if they see enemy aircraft coming, they fire at an aircraft fire at them. And then that attracts the combat air patrol to get into that position. It's pretty primitive, really, compared to today's standards. But indeed, that's the best they can do. And also because all their ships, their defensive capability is reduced because their escorts are further away. So they don't have the capability to provide close-in anti-aircraft fire to their carriers. A, a big limitation uh, is how they run things. Well, Another key factor about the Japanese is they never put the effort into damage control that we do. I believe by 1943, every single sailor on a U.S. ship has had the training in damage control. The Japanese never achieve anything like that kind of status. So they never really put the effort into damage control that we will. Again, a problem. <clears throat> well, how does our fleet run its carriers? Very, very different. Our carriers are used basically in single units, pre-war, to be the eyes of the fleet. So they're, they accompany a battleship group, and they are to provide spotting for the battleships to find the enemy fleet, perhaps to cause some damage to the enemy fleet, and then our battleships will finish the job. So they're used basically as single units. Um, and perhaps you might use a small unit, again, they have one carrier doesn't have a lot of air power to attack maybe a pinprick right on a, on a sit on a port or something. So not used the same way. Uh, when they are carriers do act in groups, which they will, they don't act in a tight group. So they're normally stationed 20 miles apart. So if I got two carriers, I'm going to keep them in two fleets 20 miles apart. They will launch their air groups totally separate from the other unit. So one carrier's air group goes out, another carrier's air group goes out. There's very little or no at this time coordination. And that's a problem. But the reason we're capable of having our carriers 20 miles apart is because we have different radio technology. We have a thing called TBS or talk between ships. 
And it's extremely high frequency radio that only has a range of about 25 miles. So we have the capability to talk to our pilots up in the air, limited, and to talk to other ships that are separated. So we don't have to put all our ships in one big cluster where they're in visual range. And that's going to make for a very, very different capability. Well, we also have an early version of radar. Our ships have radar, but the kind of radar we have cannot tell you altitude. It'll tell you that there's planes coming in, but you don't know what altitude those aircraft are at. So what we will do is we will take our combat air patrol, our fighter planes, and stack them at different altitudes. Again, that doesn't give you a lot of coordination. If they're coming in high and you got people low, they got to get up there. So it's less efficient, but it's the best that can be done at this time. Another thing is our escort ships are much closer because of this. So they can provide combat power to incoming aircraft much better than the Japanese, not to mention our weapons are better. And perhaps most important is we can control our CAP. We do have a combat information center, but there's a big problem. Everybody's on the same radio frequency. So... When somebody talks on that frequency, it blocks out other communication. So at this time in the war, our radio discipline amongst our cap fighters is poor. So they'll be talking like, hey, Joe, there's a fighter on your tail. And now the people in the combat information center can't communicate to the other fighters. So until we get better radio discipline, that's a problem as far as how efficient our combat information centers are. So that's kind of a look at what these fleets are about. So let's look at our aircraft. We've talked about Japanese aircraft in the Pearl Harbor class particularly, but we'll talk about U.S. naval capability at this time. And this fighter here is a Wildcat. It's an F-4F, and there's two different models available. They have a three and a four. How do they differ? Well, the three being the earlier version, does not have folding wings. So it takes up more room on an aircraft carrier when you store these. The three is armed with four 50 caliber machine guns. They both have the same engine at 1,200 horsepower. The four is modified so its wings fold. It also is changed to six 50 caliber machine guns instead of four. Now you'd think that would be a big advantage. Unfortunately, it doesn't have any more ammunition than the four-gun ship. So the amount of time you can fire is significantly reduced. Not to mention that because adding more machine guns, you've added weight. You've also added weight by making it folding winged. So many of the pilots actually felt that they were happier with the F4F3 than the F4F4. And it's a good aircraft. It's nearly as fast as a Zero. It's not as maneuverable as a Zero. It doesn't climb as well as a Zero. But it's got one big advantage. This thing can take a hell of a lot of punishment. It's an amazing amount of damage this aircraft can sustain and keep flying and keep fighting. So much so that the Japanese frequently make a mistake. So a Zero will get on the tail of a Wildcat and he'll come in and he'll... Just shoot the hell out of it, okay? And then what it'll do is, oh, this that plane's destroyed. It can't stay in the air. I just shot the hell out of it, right? They'll zoom down, and then to regain altitude, they come back up in front of that aircraft. Well, when they do that, that Wildcat is still firing, and, and it, that Zero blows up because it can't take hardly any damage. So a, a good aircraft, certainly not a great aircraft, but when used properly, it can outdive a zero, for example. It can still be an effective weapon. Well, let's look at our torpedo, but yes, Alan. Yeah, all this is one pilot, and they give him four and then six guns. Yes. And he's supposed to handle all that. I, I can't see that that would be an advantage. Well, the idea, okay, so the question is, is what's the advantage between four and six guns? Is that the question, really? Well, yeah, just I mean, why would why would they think that one person would be better off if he's got the same amount of ammunition and six Six guns, and he's trying to fly the plane. I mean, well, you're always flying the plane. You're pushing the button to fire the guns. Okay, the fact of the ammunition is weight. 
They just can't afford more weight to, to put more ammunition on that aircraft. Okay, so sacrifices have to be made. Okay, so it's like anything else. It's an engineering problem. You can only do so much with so much. So, yeah, so that's part of the issue. They, they don't expand the amount of ammunition because they've already increased the weight more than they wanted to. So that's kind of the issue. Okay, well, let us talk about our torpedo bombers. And this is our TBD-1 Devastator. When it was built, it was a fine aircraft. Unfortunately, by now, it is no longer a good aircraft. Uh, it is vastly underpowered. It has a 900 horsepower engine compared to our fighter that has a 1200 horsepower engine. It's heavy. How would I put this slightly? It's slow, okay? Its top speed without a torpedo is only 208 miles an hour. It's vastly inferior to the Japanese Kate, which I thought at that time was the best torpedo bomber in the world. This certainly is not. It's got a three-man crew, but when it's carrying a torpedo, they can't afford a three-man crew. Somebody has to stay home So, because it can't take the weight. So <laughs> it's a problem. It can only go 100 miles an hour to drop a torpedo, for example. So obsolete, slow. So slow, in fact, that when it's trying to, like if a Japanese fleet is going 30 knots, and this thing is behind the Japanese fleet. It actually has a tough time catching up to the fleet and passing it to get into a position to launch a torpedo. That's a slow plane. Carry any more armament other than the torpedo? Yeah, I can carry a bomb. No, but it has no guns. It has guns. It has a, a tail gun. Not in this particular configuration, but it normally has two, tail, uh, two rear firing machine guns. Yes, Alan. Um do knots and miles per hour compare? Because you said 100 miles per hour when it's armed with a torpedo and the ships are going 30 knots. I don't know what that... Knots are slightly faster than a mile per hour. Oh, okay. Right. Right. But it can barely do that any much faster than that when carrying a torpedo. Again, it's, it's vastly underpowered for its weight. Keep that in mind. Well, now we're going to talk about my favorite aircraft of World War II, indeed, the SBD-2 and 3 Douglas Dauntless. This is a tremendous aircraft for its time. It is a dive bomber. So basically what it does, it comes in at 10,000 feet, it dives down to about 2,000 feet, and then accurately drops its bomb. It can carry a 1,000-pound bomb compared to the Japanese uh, only being able to carry a, a 500 excuse me, a 250-kilogram bomb, about 560 pounds. And this particular little aircraft has got good range. It's got reasonable speed. It's armed with 250 caliber machine guns firing forward, and then one or two 30-caliber machine guns in a rear configuration. Uh, but what really makes this airplane great, and by the way, it broke the back of the Japanese Navy. It's it, Basically, all our early victories in air power are caused by this aircraft. What makes it great is that if you look at the picture, it's got looks like it's got holes in the wings. What those are is those are dive brakes. And so when I put this thing into a dive, I open those dive brakes. And what that does is it slows the aircraft down so I can go even lower, and it also steadies the aircraft. So this thing is a tremendously accurate bombing platform. And again, it will break the back of the Japanese Navy in the in the 1942-43. Yes? I've read uh, stories about these uh, being in dogfights with the Zeros, where they could get, if they could get the Zero to face them and just face to face, the Zero didn't have a chance. Well, all right. The question is, is dogfighting with this aircraft. I wouldn't say the Zero didn't have a chance. The Zero can't take the damage it can. Right. But these aircraft actually you were used to, to beef up our low-flying combat air patrol. So they would be used for su anti-submarine use too, but they would also be used as basically part of the CAP, the combat air patrol. And the idea was is that they would take on torpedo bombers. So they would fly these lower, and that would give us, well, first of all, we'd have more fighters up in the air while using these as, as basically fighters. And they had a longer loiter time than our uh, F4F. So, yeah, they were multipurpose. 
crew of how many? Two. <laughs> All right. Well, the Japanese have won everything so far. Everything's going great. One problem. The United States hasn't quit. We're supposed to quit. We're supposed to be demoralized. We're supposed to have said, okay, you can keep Asia. We got to worry about Germany. We don't do that. And the Japanese are like, hmm, well, now what do we do? That's a problem. Because their expectation was is that we would give up. Well, we don't give up. If you look at this map closely, you could see the solid line is what the Japanese have captured by April of 1942. The dotted line is what they're going to try to do. And I've circled Midway Island and the Aleutians up at the top. So let's take a little bit, a look at this. So what does the Japanese Navy want to do? The Japanese Navy says to the Japanese Army, we need to invade Australia. If we invade Australia, that'll force the Allies to quit. And the Japanese army is like, well, here's the problem. We need 10 divisions to do that, plus all the troop transports and supply ships to maintain 10 divisions. Now, let's look at this. We've got a great big army in China. <coughs> We've got an army in the Philippines. We've got an army in Burma. We've got troops in Malaya, we've got troops in Java, we got all this going on. We don't have the capability to give you 10 divisions and support it. So guess what? We can't do that. But we would be willing to do is we'd be willing to invade the Aleutian Islands because we're afraid that the U.S. will put bombers, long-range bombers on the Aleutian and bomb the northern islands of Japan, particularly Hokkaido. So Japanese Army says no. Well. Japanese Navy says, well, we need to end the war. What are we going to do? Well, what about if we blockade Australia? And that'll force the Allies to, to quit the war. And what the idea then is they're going to take the Solomon Islands, New Guinea, Fiji, New Caledonia, and basically block the Allies from being able to, to supply Australia. This is the hope is to knock this out of the war. Well, Yamamoto, who led, of course, the Japanese fleet, he goes to the heads of the Navy and goes, you guys are all wrong. What we need to do is we need to destroy the U.S. fleet because if we destroy the U.S. fleet, everything else will fall into place. And the Japanese Navy's headquarters says, no, you're, no, we don't want to do that. And Yamamoto once again says, well, here's what we're going to do then. If you don't want to do what I want to do, then I'm going to quit. Just like Pearl Harbor. And the Japanese Navy's like, oh, man, this guy's like a big hero. What are we going to do? So they said, okay, fine. What we're going to do is we're going to do both. We're going to capture all these islands, and we're going to attack Midway. So we're going to do both at the same time. And this is known historically as become known as victory disease. The Japanese have become so overconfident that they can accomplish anything they want to accomplish and that the Allies are so weak that they can win just with victory disease. And it, and unfortunately, they're now going to commit it to something that they don't have the capability to do. Well, how does that first part come along? And it's simply this. Is they're going to attack New Guinea first. First attack will be on New Guinea, and they're going to hit the circle in the middle, the red circle in the middle, at Ley and Salama'ua. And they're going to invade that on March 8th. Well, the U.S. codebreakers have figured this out. And so Nimitz, who is now in charge of the U.S. fleet, is going to put two aircraft carriers in to defend this, these, this part of New Guinea. <clears throat> so sends them in. Now, look at this picture. Up at the top, you can see Rabal in the black circle. And in the bottom, you can see what I refer to as the Gulf of Papua. And the idea is the U.S. carriers are afraid of Japanese land-based air power, which would come from Rabaul. 
So they're afraid to go into the Solomon Sea. Well, what they're going to do instead is they're going to come in around and come in from the Gulf of Papua to attack this over the Owen Stanley mountain range. And this is going to be a pretty effective raid. First of all, the Japanese are not expecting this. They don't expect anybody to be in the Gulf of Papua and attack them over the mountains. So they do this. And it's, it's really a complete surprise. But there's a problem. Once again, our torpedo bombers. The torpedo bombers, when they're carrying a torpedo, can't get over the Owen Stanley Mountains. So they're struggling with these, with these old devastators that just don't have the capability. So what the pilots do is they fly along the side of the mountains until they catch an updraft. And the updraft lifts them over the mountain so then they can launch the attack. That's how primitive those aircraft are. Remember, they only got two instead of three guys. So this works out quite well. And they sink three transports, a minesweeper, they damage seven other ships. And the key part here is the Japanese now realize, the Japanese army, that they can't attack Port Moresby in the face of this kind of opposition. I've showed Port Moresby there with the black rectangle. That's what their real goal is, to capture that. that once they capture that, they've got New Guinea, basically. Well, so they go back to the Japanese Navy and say, you know, we'd really like to capture Port Moresby and do your plan, but unfortunately, we need aircraft carriers decision is made not to bring all of Kido Butai, the six aircraft carriers. Instead, what they're going to do is they're going to break that fleet up. And they're going to send two aircraft carriers. It's going to be Carrier Division 5, the Shokaku, and the Zuikaku. And that is going to be the key piece for the offensive capability. They're also going to take the new little light carrier, Shoho, and Shoho is going to be the escort ship for the transport fleet. So if you look at this picture, you can see that coming from Rabaul, they're going to come down through the Jomard Pass to Port Moresby, the big red circle. They're going to bring in carrier and, and the Shohos with that group. They're going to bring in all the way from the east, coming around the Solomon Islands, Carrier Division 5. The expectation is Carrier Division 5 will be able to defeat the U.S. carriers and then will move onwards to attack the Australian coastline. And the idea is that is to protect the invasion convoy from land-based Australian capabilities, aircraft. So you can see it's really like a three-stage plan there. So it starts out. With, with basically uh, the fact that we have intelligence to understand where they're at. Once again, our code breakers have figured this out, that this is the Japanese plan. So indeed, Nimitz is going to keep two carriers, the Yorktown and the Lexington, and he's going to create a large cruiser force of U.S. and Australian cruisers to be under a gentleman called Admiral Fletcher, Frank Jack Fletcher. And there's going to be the key to trying to defend this Port Moresby. Well, on May 3rd, the first part of the invasion takes place where the Japanese invade the island of Tulagi. That is the red circle. That is right by Guadalcanal. Probably everybody's familiar with Guadalcanal. And they land on May 3rd. They are basically unopposed and capture this. But then on the next, very next day, the Yorktown launches a strike. And the Yorktown strike sinks a destroyer. A couple of other small ships are sunk and damaged. It's not a particularly effective raid, to be honest with you. But they do sink a Japanese destroyer, the Kikuzuki. And if you're so interested, you could go to Tulagi. They actually towed this to a nearby island called Florida Island. And you can see the wreck of the Kikuzuki is still there today. I know many of you are probably dying to go there. I know I am. but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, at this point, uh, the Japanese Carrier Division 5 is 300 miles uh, east of Tulagi, and they're looking for the Yorktown. 
they don't find the Yorktown because the Yorktown is actually south of Tulagi. They believe it's actually east of there. But so they're wrong. This is kind of how this whole battle goes. Everybody's looking for everybody this whole time. Not necessarily finding anybody either. Uh, well, then Fletcher is informed by Pearl Harbor that the Japanese actual invasion of Port Moresby is going to be on May 10th. And what he does then is he sends his cruiser force to defend the Jomard Pass, which I have in the black circle there. But in the meantime, nobody's found each other, and the Japanese have actually gotten in behind Fletcher's carriers. So again, everybody's searching for everybody. Nobody knows where anything is. In fact, Fletcher's not even sure how many Japanese carriers there are. Well, then finally on May 6th, a B-17 from Australia finds the invasion tax force north of Jomart. And they say there's two carriers there. So now we've got a problem for, for the uh, U.S. because Fletcher and these and the Japanese are basically continually looking for each other. So Fletcher's trying to get ready for this battle. And he decides to refuel his carriers so they can stay on, in combat condition longer with the oiler Neosho and with the destroyer Sims. And they are detached and sent south to get out of danger's way because that's where Fletcher thinks that the Japanese aren't. Well, unfortunately... They're both wrong. The Japanese think that Fletcher is south of them, and Fletcher thinks the Japanese are north of them, and neither one is right. So they're both looking in the wrong directions. And finally, a Japanese, because the Japanese are searching south, they find what they believe is a carrier, because they're misinformed. What they found is the Neosho and the Sims. And the Japanese launch a 78-plane strike to destroy an oiler and a destroyer. Well, needless to say, they're going to do that. In the meantime, Fletcher is searching north, where the Japanese carriers are actually south, but he goes after the invasion convoy because he's misinformed that there's two Japanese carriers there. So he launches a 93-plane strike on that little, S well, it's not an escort carrier, it's a light carrier, the Shoho. So the little Shoho gets destroyed by 93 aircraft. That's way more than you need to do attack Shoho. And uh, you can see in the picture here, that's Shoho getting destroyed. So, and that's, the message is sent out by one of the pilots, famous message, scratch one flat, flat top. And that is a huge propaganda piece in the United States at this time. So it's a famous war cry, scratch one flat top. Well, it still hasn't solved the problem here because both the fleet carriers on each side are still roaming around looking for each other. Well, finally, on May 8th, literally two minutes apart, they find each other. Now, again, they don't see each other. This is done by aircraft. And, in fact, nobody ever sees anybody in this battle. Everything is done by aircraft. First battle in history where that's the case. Neither fleet ever sights each other. Well... So now everybody's launching. So the Japanese are launching a combined strike with their two carriers into one group. The U.S. launches two separate strikes because that's our doctrine. Each carrier launches separately. And they've got these two large strikes coming up in the air. Well, the U.S. scores first. They score three 1,000-pound bomb hits on the Shokaku. Juikaku is actually under cloud cover and is not seen. So everybody attacks Shokaku, and they get three 1,000-pound bomb hits. But remember, it's a pretty well-defended carrier. So it is not sunk by three 1,000-pound bombs because of the armored flight deck, etc. And But its flight deck is inoperable, so it can no longer operate aircraft. And it begins to withdraw from the battle. Well, the Japanese launch their hits, and they get... As you can see in this picture, two bomb hits on the Lexington, two torpedoes hit the Lexington, and one bomb hits the Yorktown. The Japanese believe that they have sunk both U.S. carriers, but actually both U.S. carriers are, are pretty good. They're, they're surviving until a problem happens. The Lexington has a fuel leak from its aviation gas. It begins to fill that 
hangar deck with fumes, a spark hits, and basically the, the ship goes up and it begins to have uh, its ammunition detonate. And you can see that in this picture. That's what happens to the Lexington. It's a disaster. Literally, that ship implodes, basically. You can see the picture next to it. What does it happen to the Shokaku? The Shokaku, that is the bow of the Shokaku hit by a thousand pound bomb. So you can see that it, these bombs do a hell of a lot of damage. But indeed, that ship is okay. So what is the going on here? This is a tactical victory for the Japanese. They've destroyed a U.S. fleet carrier. They've sunk an oiler, which surprisingly you don't even think this, but oilers are really important because you can't refuel at sea. And we don't have a lot of ships with that capability. We have tankers, but we don't have a lot of naval oilers. So this is a loss. And of course, we've lost the Sims. The Japanese have lost the little Shoho and the Shokaku is badly damaged, and the air group on the Zurikaku is decimated by U.S. defenses. So, again, tactical victory for the U.S., or excuse me, for the Japanese, but it's a strategic victory for the U.S. because the Japanese cannot attack Port Moresby without air cover. They don't have any air cover anymore, so the Japanese invasion fleet withdraws. So, Port Moresby is saved. But another key part of this is both these carriers, the Shokaku and Zuyukaku, were going to be used to support Kido Butai and the attack on Midway Island. Now, both of these carriers, for various reasons, are out of that battle. Shokaku with too much battle damage, and Zuyukaku because it does not have its full complement of aircraft and pilots. So again, this is a huge strategic victory for the U.S. And with that, let us take a very short break. Komodo's plan, okay? Well, first of all, we got to remember how many carriers each side has, all right? Total Japanese carriers in the Pacific are six fleet carriers, and then they have three light carriers, and then they have an old carrier, the Hosho, which is basically non-functional. At this time, the U.S., basically 1942, early 42, the U.S. had four fleet carriers in the Pacific. So you can see that we're outnumbered. Well, after Coral Sea, the Japanese believe we've only got two carriers left. And they're relatively accurate in this regard. Of course, the Lexington has been sunk. The Yorktown has taken damage from a 250 kilogram bomb. The Saratoga is believed to be sunk by the Japanese because it was hit by a Japanese torpedo from a submarine. So the Japanese believe all three of those carriers are gone. Well, in fact, only one of them is gone. The Yorktown has still survived, but it's damaged. And the Saratoga has survived, but it has gone back to the United States to be repaired. So technically, they really only have, we only really have two fleet carriers that are in 100% condition in the Pacific at this time. So the Japanese are, are somewhat right. Well, why do we attack Midway? Remember, Yamamoto would rather attack Pearl Harbor. But it's realized at this time that we have defended Pearl Harbor so much more than early in the war. For example, there's over 100,000 troops on, on Pearl Harbor at this time. That's a lot. The Japanese realize that. Plus, we've got a lot more air power there. So the Japanese have to come up with an alternative. And the alternative is going to be Midway Island. Now, Midway Island is not exactly a large place. Uh, it's about 2.5 square miles. So it's tiny, but it's in a key location. It's basically on the doorstep of Hawaii. And Yamamoto believes we must defend this. It's got another advantage for the Japanese is it's out of U.S. bomber range. 1,300 miles is too far for even B-17s to make a strike on this island and come back. So they're really confident that this, first of all, it will 
draw the U.S. fleet out. That's always the plan here because Yamamoto is convinced that he needs to trick us. He needs to, he needs to get us to come out and defend this island, and then he can swoop in with all his ships and destroy our fleet. Well, that's not really the case. <laughs> uh, but the idea is he's going to use not just aircraft carriers, but he's going to use his battleships. So for this upcoming battle of Midway, he deploys virtually the entire Japanese fleet, including seven battleships. Now, we don't have really any battleships in this area. We have some on the West Coast. So he's thinking that what I can do is I can, like, get the U.S. fleet to come out and try to get to Kido Butai, and then I can take all my other ships and swoop in and crush the U.S. fleet. And that's his plan. Well, because the U.S. fleet's afraid of me. Well, so basically what he's going to do, he's going to try to attack mid midway with Kido Butai. He's going to set up a screen of submarines between Hawaii and Midway, to, not only to spot when our fleet comes out, but hopefully to sink a few ships. And the Japanese have got this whole plan built up about how they're going to basically trick us. And they're also going to launch seaplanes. So what they're going to do is they're going to send a seaplanes from the Marshall Islands they're going to land at a place called French Frigate Shoals. They're going to be refueled by a Japanese submarine, then fly back on to Pearl Harbor to do recon and maybe drop a bomb or two. They actually have done this before. It wasn't a particularly effective raid, but they've actually used the same idea to, at French Frigate Shoals previously in the war. So that's another part of their recon plan. Well, the problem with this thing, and why I refer to this as basically a Byzantine plan, is that the Japanese fleet is spread out all over the place because he's going to trick us. He's got battleships over here and cruisers over there and Kiyobutai over here, the transport with the invasion force over here. And there, and none of this stuff is self-supporting. They're all hundreds of miles away. None of these ships can use radio because they're all under radio silence, so they can't communicate what's going on. And so basically, the, this plan is really not a good plan, to put it bluntly. It's a bad plan. And the simple reason is the same thing we had at Pearl Harbor. At Pearl Harbor, we made the assumption of what the Japanese would do rather than what they were capable of. And it's exactly the same issue here. They're making the same mistake. They believe what we will do rather than what we are capable of. And boy, we are capable of some mighty good things. Because I've talked about numerous times in this class about intelligence. And we've got fantastic intelligence. And it's partially due to pre-war. We saw that Yamamoto pre-war had been gone to college at Harvard. He was the naval attache in Washington two times. So Yamamoto served that function as the same thing that we do. We send young officers to Japan and other places. They learn the language. They learn about the fleet. Perhaps they do a little casual spying. And two of these guys that we've sent are Eddie Layton and Joe Rochefort. And these guys are key. Well, they've never, they meet actually in Japan and they form a partnership. Rochefort is a brilliant code breaker. And Eddie Layton has that capability of taking tidbits of information and putting them into one piece and understanding what's going on and making sense of those odd pieces of information. And Layton also has the capability to present this to Admiral Nimitz and key U.S. players. So by 1942, they are starting to be able, not totally, but to break the Japanese code, naval code, not the Code purple, which I talked about. The naval code is JN25B. And they're starting to be able to predict Japanese plans. And pretty darn good. Well, <laughs> much is made, particularly in the movies, about Rochefort being kind of an oddball. I think that's overrated. But he is a little less than 100% uh, Navy. He will wear a smoking jacket in, in where he's working, and he wears slippers, and he's not. 
but he's not a kook. Okay, I, I think that's gro grossly overdone. But there's a, the main people that break codes in the United States for the Navy are a thing called OOP 20G, and that is in Washington. And I, uh, well, OOP 20G and having this argument, of course, with the uh, with uh, Leighton and uh, Rochefort and. Of course, they believe that that attack is going to be in the U.S. versus that. So we got back to there. So the code breakers know that the Japanese are going to attack a place called AF. They don't know where AF is, though. So they need to find this out. And how are they going to find out how AF is, where AF is? And this guy, Captain Jasper Holmes, comes up with an idea. There's a radio, or excuse me, a telephone cable that goes underwater from Pearl Harbor to Midway. And he has an idea. He goes, you know what we're going to do is we're going to just use that cable to tell Midway to send an open code message, a, 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 a message in the clear that there's water shortage on Midway. Because Midway has no indigenous water supply. It needs to get its water supply from desalinization. So they're going to say the desalinization pro, uh, uh, plant broke and they're short of water. Well, indeed, they send that out in the code, not in code, excuse me, and the very next day the Japanese in codes say AF is short of water. Well, now, indeed, we know that the next Japanese attack is going to be at Midway Island. This enrages OP20G. They're totally angry about this because now they've been embarrassed and they've been upstaged. And the admiral in charge, Redmond, and his brother, who is also uh, at part of OP20G, 20, OP 20 they decide after the Battle of Midway to destroy Rochefort's career. And indeed, they do that. They have him transferred from code breaking to running a floating dry dock on the West Coast. He's completely out of the war. Now, they've taken a brilliant guy, a brilliant code breaker that's won this battle, key to winning this battle, and moved him to a nothing position just because of spite, because they're angry. And Rochefort never gets any credit until after his death, because, again, this is all secret. So... It's a, it's a shameful story of what occurred for, for this gentleman. What but the Redmond brothers get? Uh, basically nothing. Probably promoted. Probably promoted. You know? the, the, let's put it this way. They have a bad place in history. Okay? <laughs> That's about what happened to them. Well, anyway, now Nimitz has this information. He knows where the attack's going to be, so he's got to do something. So what he begins to do is he sends a battalion of Marines, an extra battalion, to defend Midway. He also scrapes up all the aircraft he can get, which is 126 Army and Navy aircraft, and sends them out to Midway. That's about all you can put on an island that's only, you know, 2.5 miles. So they got a lot of aircraft and a lot of capability on this little tiny island. But if some of those aircraft or whatever they could scrape up, including that famous Brewster Buffalo goes out there, and an obsolete uh, dive bomber we have called the Vindicator goes out there as well. But they're sending literally everything they've got. Well, he's got another problem. He's short of carriers. He's got two carriers that are in good condition. They take the Yorktown that just gets into port, because remember, it was all the way in the South Pacific. It takes a long time to get back. Uh, and they put it in dry dock. They put it in dry dock for three days, and they literally work day and night trying to get this carrier back into the battle. And they finally do get it back together enough, and they literally send it out with construction workers on it still working. But remember, they have a depleted force of aircraft from this battle. But remember, the Saratoga went back to the United States. They left its air group in Hawaii. We transfer that air group onto the Yorktown. So the Yorktown has now got a full complement of air power it's not 100% ready to fight, but it's as good as it can be. And it's going out to fight. So Nimitz has another problem. 
His main carrier admiral, the most experienced carrier admiral he has, is Admiral Halsey. Halsey is sick. He's got dermatitis so bad that he's been hospitalized. Now, they've got to get somebody to replace him, and they replace him with Raymond Spruance, a cruiser admiral. Turns out to be a really good choice, as we'll see, is throughout World War II. But the Enterprise and the Hornet sail, and then a day later, the Yorktown sails under command of Admiral Fletcher, who has some experience with carrier battles because he just fought in Carol's Coral Sea. And they're all going out to a place called Point Luck. And that is going to be northeast of Midway Island. Well, the Japanese plan is beginning to unravel immediately. First of all, Kido Butai isn't whole. It only has four carriers instead of six. And, of course, we talked the Shokaku is damaged, and the Zhuikaku is short of air crew. The Japanese make the decision not to transfer air crew from the Shokaku to the Zhuikaku. The reason they don't do this is that's not their doctrine. An air group stays with its carrier. They're, they're considered to be an integral unit, unlike the U.S. that transfers air group from ship to ship, not looking them as part of the ship's complement. The Japanese don't do that because that would violate their doctrine. So they, instead of having five carriers they could have had, are only going to go in with four. Well, Basically, now they're down to 227 aircraft on the, those ships. And part of that reason is, is the, the Kido Butai has been in combat for the, constantly for six months. So their units are worn out. They don't have a full complement of aircraft. Their ship's crews are tired. And what's perhaps most amazing to me is, and this is a points to their industrial capability, for the entire year of 1942, they only make 56 carrier bombers. Now, why is that? Because they're transferring to new models. And unlike the United States, if we needed a new model, we just build a new factory to build that model until that model is that factory is online, then we shut the old factory down and start building a new one. They don't have that capability. So they literally make the decision to shut down those lines to transfer to new aircraft. Because that's the, that's what they have to do. And, of course, that's not really helpful in the middle of a war to be doing that. But, again, that's the best they can do. And then the recon plan is a total failure. The aircraft, these uh, flying boats, it's actually quite a good aircraft, really. Uh, it can, It's going to go to French frigate shoals and be refueled by a submarine. Well, the submarine shows up. And lo and behold, there's U.S. ships, destroyers, at French Frigate Shoals. So they can't possibly surface and, and refuel an aircraft when we got U.S. ships there. So that plan is over. The key part, too, is remember that submarine picket line? It's late. So by the time they put that picket line in place, our fleet has actually sailed past that picket line. So we're already at point luck, luck when the... Japanese uh, get that submarine line in place. So again, that's a failure. So they have no idea, the Japanese, of where the U.S. fleet is. They firmly believe, to the best of their knowledge, that all our ships are at Pearl Harbor. Well, now, it's time to take a little digression here, and I'm going to call this No Miracle at Midway. Now, many of you perhaps have read a book called Miracle at Midway by Gordon Prang. Uh, perhaps you have read Incredible Victory by Walter Lord. These are both very, very popular books. And they've created what I will refer to as the misconception that this plucky little U.S. fleet facing the entire Japanese Navy stopped them save Midway, and change the entire course of the war because they had that American know-how, okay? Well, it didn't really work out that way. And another reason this is so distorted historically is because of a gentleman I've talked about before, and that's Mitsuo Fuchida. Fuchida, the best way I can put him is he's a self-promoter. 
The other way I would put it, he's just a flat-out liar. So Fuchida, after the war, meets up with Gordon Prang. And as a historian, this would be huge for Gordon Prang. He's like, he's got, this guy was at Pearl Harbor. He's in the command structure of Kido Bukai. He's been at all these big battles. This is going to be a great guy to interview and, and get the real story about history. Unfortunately, Fuchida doesn't tell him the real story about history. Fuchida basically makes stuff up. Uh, for example, the second strike at Pearl Harbor is made up. He's going to make up stuff at this battle, too, which we'll get to. But Fuchida has changed how U.S. historians looked at the early part of World War II significantly by always basically saying this, that, well, you know, if the Japanese admirals had listened to me, things would have been different, okay? Well, that ain't the case. So anyway... <laughs> When we look at this battle, remember, we've talked about the key power of naval capability right now is not battleships, regardless of how many Yamamoto brings along. It's air power. So the Japanese have 227 organic aircraft on Kido Butai's four carriers, well below its strength. They also are carrying 21 Zeros that are going to be stationed at Midway after it's captured to be its air defense. But Midway's Zeros don't really add any combat power to Kido Butai as far as offensive capability. They're really good for defense, but they're not capable of that. So, 248 total aircraft for the Japanese. We have 126 aircraft stationed on Midway Island and 233 on our three carriers. So we outnumber the Japanese in air power, 248 to 359. Got it. Now, we don't have as many aircraft carriers, but we have Midway Island, which until they capture it is an unsinkable aircraft carrier. So you can see that really what matters in this battle, which is air power, we have a distinct advantage over the Japanese. Well, again, the Japanese don't have any knowledge of where our carriers are. They think they're still in Pearl Harbor. So that's a failure. And finally, the U.S. Catalinas, well, I'll show you a picture of a Catalina shortly. On June 3rd, spots the transport fleet of the Japanese. This is exactly when Rochefort and Leighton have predicted they will see it. So now we know that indeed, that information is 100% correct. So we are waiting for those Japanese. We're up at Point Luck, and the Japanese are spread out all over the place, but the only thing that really matters is Kido Butai. And at this point, Midway begins to launch B-17 bombers, because the transport fleet's so long way away, to attack that transport fleet. They don't really score any hits. Uh, actually, a PBY, believe it or not, drops a torpedo and hits a Japanese tanker, which is pretty amazing, uh, considering the PBY is anything but a torpedo bomber. <laughs> so, uh, but <clears throat> we can see now everything is falling into place for the United States at this point. Well, there's the PBY Catalina, very excellent aircraft, actually. So now it is June 4th. Kido Butai has not been sighted, but it's 200 miles northwest of Midway Island, and they launch 108 aircraft. The reason they launch 108 aircraft is Nagumo, the head of Kido Butai, the admiral in charge, he keeps half of his aircraft on board armed with torpedoes and naval-type bombs, armor-piercing bombs. The 108 aircraft he launches are armed with land attack weapons. Because he's not going to put all his, you know, everything into one basket. He's still protecting himself by keeping half of his aircraft armed with anti-ship weapons. They also send out what I would refer to as a weak reconnaissance force. They could have sent out a lot more, but they don't. But they still send out a recon force. And again, the, I think the reason is, is they believe that the U.S. fleet is still at Pearl Harbor. So they don't do as much, perhaps, as they could have. But it's really not that far off of their doctrine to send out a, 
a recon force, which they do. Well, a, the PBY, or another one of these PBYs, spots the Japanese aircraft coming in towards Midway, that 108 aircraft. And he radios back to Midway. He goes, incoming Japanese. And they launch all their fighters and all their bombers, so they're not going to be caught on the ground like we saw at, at Clark Field, for example, in the Philippines. They launch 26 Marine fighters, a lot of them being Buffaloes, and they run into 36 Zeros. The 36 Zeros do a heck of a lot of damage. They shoot down 15 of the Marine fighters, and when the Marine fighters land back on Midway, they're so shot up that only two are serviceable out of that total 26 aircraft. So again, our fighter capability on Midway is greatly reduced. Well, Japanese bomb the island and trying to knock out the airfield. And the bombing is good, but it's not good enough. And the head of this Japanese uh, unit radios back to Nagumo that they need to launch a second strike. Now, as a bonus, I'm going to send you a link, and you'll be able to see actual footage of this battle that was taken by the famous director, John Ford. It's a 16-minute, uh, basically, U.S. propaganda piece, but it actually shows Japanese bombers attacking Midway Island. It's, it's, really, uh, it's really good. I guess that's the best way. And it's been digitally remastered, so it's pretty clear. John Ford is in there. Uh, the Navy wanted him to take pictures. That was his job. That was his job. Yep. So anyway, need a second strike. Then, the, then another PBY finds Kido Butai. So now we know where they are. And this begins a string of what I would refer to as uncoordinated attacks. So remember, all our bombers on Midway Island are up in the air, and they're armed, and they start to launch in a stream heading towards Kido Butai, and they will launch continuous attacks on Kido Butai, and that's going to be a problem. So between 710 and 820, four different groups from Midways attack Kido. And what they're doing is they're not scoring any hits, but they're keeping the Japanese incredibly busy. They're constantly, you know, getting cap fighters up in the air, landing cap fighters, and the Japanese are constantly scrambling around. They can't do anything because they're constantly avoiding bombs and torpedoes. So it's basically tying down the Japanese fleet from doing what they'd probably like to do. But at 7.15, because Nagumo had that radio message that, hey, we need a second strike on Midway, he says, okay, here's what we need to do. We need to take all those bombs and torpedoes that are on our aircraft ready to go to strike ships and convert them to land attack weapons. And so they begin to do this. They start to, and, and again, they don't have a lot of time, so they're not taking this weaponry and putting it back into magazines. They're basically just pushing it off to the side and reloading as fast as possible. Then the hammer drops. At 8 o'clock, they're recon plane sees the American carriers. And it's like, uh-oh, this isn't good. And then he orders, well, we need to put all those torpedoes and armor-piercing bombs back on the airplanes. So now there's another scramble. Again, they're being attacked from land place units. They've got weapons all over the, the hangar decks, and they're constantly trying to get this stuff organized. It's just a mess. And then some of the Japanese admirals tell Nagumo, you know, why don't we just launch with whatever we've got? And he says, no, I don't want to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to follow our doctrine. Our doctrine is to send large combined organized strikes. And we're going to land all our aircraft that attack Midway first, get everybody armed, and then we're going to send one big strike to destroy the U.S. carriers. Much is made of this historically, that this was a huge mistake on Nagumo's part. The fact of the matter is it makes absolutely no difference. The reason is because the U.S. carriers have already launched, and they're on their way. So the whole argument that, well, if he had done this, he'd done that, no. 
it doesn't matter because our planes are in the air and they're coming. Well, it wouldn't have mattered for what happened to the Japanese ships if they had put enough of what they had, it could have had an effect on our ships. Perhaps, but again, they're attacking with land based land uh, ammunition. And as you'll see, our carriers are mighty sturdy. So I would say maybe they would have got some damage, but again, they couldn't so launch a full strike. Guys are saying just go up there and bomb whatever we got. Whatever we got. Oh, okay. Okay. I agree with that. Yeah. So it doesn't. It wouldn't make a difference to the outcome of the battle. Is my point. Okay. So the U.S. carriers are going to launch three uncoordinated strikes. Remember, each carrier launches on its own. There's no coordination between other than they've all received the order to launch. Well. The first carry we'll talk about is the Hornet. The Hornet's strike force is under a command of Stanhope Ring. Stanhope Ring decides that he's going to head directly west. The Japanese carriers are southwest. So he's flying off in the wrong direction. And the commander of the Torpedo Squadron under Ring, his name is Waldron, Torpedo 8, famous. He says to Ring, no, we're going the wrong way. We can't do this. And Ring says, no, you're going to follow me. I know where we're going. I'm in charge. And Waldron, on his own volition, decides to break off from the squadron and head directly southwest. Ring, on the other hand, continues to fly west so far that his planes begin to run out of fuel. And he has to turn back. They never hit anything. And a lot of his fighters actually don't have enough fuel left to land at Midway or back on their carriers, and they go into the water. So he loses a lot of fighters and hits nothing. Torpedo 8, on the other hand, under Waldron, amazingly goes directly to the Japanese carriers, and they launch an attack completely unsupported. And those old vindicators, excuse me, devastators, those old devastators get shot down. Every single aircraft in Torpedo 8 is destroyed. There's only one survivor from the entire squadron. It's, uh, it's really pretty brave that they did that. But again, it's a disaster. Much is made that the sacrifice of Torpedo 8 was critical to this battle. That what happened is, is that because they came in unescorted, they drew all the Japanese fighters down to sea level, and that allowed our dive bombers to come in unimpeded and destroy the Japanese fleet. Sadly, that's not what happened. Torpedo 8 arrives one hour before the dive bombers do. So, again, it makes it, it doesn't take anything away from what those people did, but the fact is that they did not really have any real outcome on the battle. They score no hits but they all basically are destroyed. Well, and there's no survivor from that. One survivor. His name is Gay. He's shot down and they pick him up off a raft. Yeah. His name is Gay. Yep. Yeah, actually he did. That's actually true. One of the few things accurate in that movie. Uh, anyway, what's going on with the rest of these units? Well, Commander Wade McCluskey from the Enterprise, he's leading 30 of my favorite airplane, that SPD. And he's gone too far southwest. So he's basically missed the Japanese carriers too. And he's running out of fuel. And he's all of a sudden he sees a Japanese destroyer, and that destroyer is heading making a beeline north. And he says, you know what? I think I'm going to follow that destroyer. And that's what he does, because that destroyer was hunting a U.S. submarine that attacked Kido Butai. Again, didn't score any hits. Well, he, he goes north and runs straight into Kido Butai. Now, he's coming in with 30 SPDs. At the same time, by just pure luck, 17 SPDs from Yorktown are coming in from the northeast. So the Japanese now are getting hit by dive bombers from two separate directions. Well. The continuous attacks, remember, they've had four groups come in from Midway. They've had Torpedo 8 come in. The Japanese cap is running out of 
you know, they're constantly landing, rearming, et cetera. They're not, they're tired basically too, really. So they've been fighting for hours. And the Japanese cap is now out of position. And McCluskey, some people say he made a mistake. There's a lot of debate on this, and I'm not going to take the time to go into this in detail. But some people say that he made, miscommunicated to the unit, and all 30 of his aircraft were going to attack the aircraft carrier Kaga. Then another squadron commander named Dick Best, and he's also portrayed in the 2019 movie, he leads his little group to attack the Akagi, okay? There's a lot of debate on this. No one's really sure. It could have been five, could have been three. Regardless, the bulk of McCluskey's aircraft attack the Kaga. They score five hits, and Kaga is toast. Well, Dick Best, and however many aircraft went with him, they score one hit, which is actually credited to Dick Best, of a 1,000-pound bomb on the Akagi. It's much like the same thing that happened to the Arizona. They hit it exactly where they needed to. So that bomb penetrates the flight deck. It explodes into the hangar deck, which is full of aircraft that are fueled and have bombs, and ordnance is laying all over it. It starts a huge fire. And that one bomb is enough to destroy the Akagi. Well, the Yorktown 17 aircraft, they go after the Soryu. And you can see this picture. That's where they scored 3,000-pound bombs on the Soryu. Same situation. The Soryu is completely destroyed. So in a matter of 10 minutes, the Japanese have lost three of their aircraft carriers. Now, here's where we get back to Mr. Fuchida. So Fuchida makes the claim that all the Japanese second, the strike force that was going to go after their our carriers was on the deck. Their engines are turning. They're ready to go. And then the gods intervene. And out of the sky, he yells, hell divers. And our, our dive bombers come down and destroy the, the just seconds before the Japanese were going to strike us, right? Never happened. Total fabrication. There's actually photographs of the U from the U.S. dive bombers that show that the decks of the Japanese ships are empty. All they have on them is cap fighters. So all those aircraft, with their weapons, with their fuel, everything was down in those hangar decks. So when our bombs hit those hangar decks, they got an inferno. So... Again, Fuchita, but it sure makes Fuchita look good. Like, wow, well, you know, we almost had a chance, you know? No, uh uh, total fabrication. Well, the Hiryu is the only carrier they have left. And the Hiryu is going to launch, as best it can, it's going to launch 18 of those Val dive bombers and six zero escorts. That's all they have. And the captain and the admiral on board the here you make a bad mistake. Remember, Japanese aircraft have longer range than ours. He makes the decision to go charging towards the U.S. fleet, three carriers versus one. What he could have done is gone the opposite direction, launched his planes, and stayed out of our range because he has longer range aircraft. Foolish. Well, they launch an attack, and quite amazingly, quite good, they score three hits on the Yorktown, so much so that the Yorktown is stopped. And the Japanese pilots, the few that survive, basically say, we, we think we've knocked the Yorktown out. We think it's going to sink. Yorktown's damage control is so good that in a matter of about a half hour, they get this thing back up and running to 18 knots. Well, the 1330, the Hiryu launches it's torpedo bombers, again, with six zeros. They score two torpedo hits on the Yorktown. So now the Yorktown's been hit by three bombs, two torpedoes. The captain believes it's going to sink. It starts to list heavily, and he thinks it's almost going to roll over. So he abandons ship. Well, the next morning, Yorktown's still floating. In fact, it's kind of right at itself. So... They decide to scrape up a salvage crew. They get back on board. They take the destroyer Hammond and put it next to them to help them get the ship under control. And they begin to tow the ship back to Pearl Harbor. 
Japanese submarine comes along, gets in through the escorts, fires a spread of torpedoes. They score two hits on the Yorktown and one hit on the Hammond. The hit on the Hammond breaks it in two and it sinks immediately. Once again, they abandon the Yorktown. But the Yorktown now, think about this, it's taken three bombs, four torpedoes, and it still doesn't sink till the next day. So it's incredibly sturdy ships for a 20,000 ton ship to take that much damage and survive as well as it did. So what about the Hiryu? Let's go back a day. Uh, the Hiryu, of course, has gotten too close to the US fleet. We launch a group of, again, SPDs, my favorite plane. They score four hits. And basically, they open up to hear you like a tin can, as you'll see in this picture. That is the entire bow of the flight deck on the hear you just ripped open. It's a floating wreck. So what's happened in this battle? It's absolutely clearly a U.S. victory. We've lost one fleet carrier. We've lost a destroyer. We have 150 aircraft lost and 307 dead. But the Japanese have lost four fleet carriers. And I don't talk about the cruiser part. We just don't have time to go into that today. They've had lost all 248 of their aircraft and have 3,057 killed in action. Now, it's often said that this broke the back of Japanese naval air power. I would argue that it did not. And simply this, total Japanese air crew losses. Remember, there's three people on a Kate, there's two on a Val. Total air crew losses is only 110 men. Now, yeah, they lost 248 aircraft, but only 36 of those were actually killed on board ship. So the bigger loss here is not air crew, it's the people that support those air crew. For example, train mechanics 721, and engineers 690. Remember, those people were down in those uh, hangar decks. And of course, they were an inferno. So when we look at World War II, this particularly early part, total Japanese naval aircraft losses from April of 1942 to April of 1943 were 2,817 aircraft. So in this battle, they didn't even lose 10% of their aircraft, nor nearly that percentage of air crew. So this is not the end of Japanese air power in, in the Pacific in World War II. I would certainly argue that that will take place later in the Solomon Islands. So big piece there. And But the biggest loss is Kido Butai. Okay, that capability to put massive amounts of aircraft into the air under a coordinated strike, that is gone. And I'll quote from John Parshall's and Tully's really excellent book. Uh, it's called Shattered Sword. And he says this, their loss was permanently ruined by what had been the most successful weapon system of the war and hence must be ranked as far and away the most important material loss of the battle. So again, the Japanese no longer have that capability to launch massive airstrikes from carriers. So the question brings this, and many people would say this was the decisive battle of the Pacific War, that this totally changed how things would be in the Pacific. And I would argue again that I don't really think that's true. I don't really believe this was the decisive battle. But what it did do, Remember, the Japanese outnumbered us vastly in carriers in the Pacific. At the end of this battle, the Japanese have two fleet carriers. The U.S. has two fleet carriers in the Pacific. So in one day, the U.S. has managed to achieve parity with the Japanese Navy, and that will lead to our ability to begin a counteroffensive that same year in the Pacific. And Thank you all for coming today, and we'll talk about uh, New Guinea again next week. Thank you.